critical value of one. Instead of getting bigger over time, during inflation, the universe gets big really quickly, and the density stays nearly constant. So we have one over a number that very rapidly gets big. One over a big number is a very small number. So in fact, the universe should have been driven to look flat to us, even if it started with some arbitrary or different curvature at early times. Inflation gives a mechanism, a physical dynamics, that should drive the universe to look flat today, even if it didn't start out as flat. We don't have to assume that it's flat at early times. Now, when I MIT's um, second day celebration for 2019. This marks the uh, 85th birthday of uh, Carl Sagan. And um, just for those who don't know about us, we're the Secular Society. We uh, provide support and community for secular people at MIT, uh, promoting uh, reason and science. And um, we have like a bunch of activities, including Sagan Day, which is uh, something that we've been celebrating for a couple of years now. Uh, as I said, this marks it is uh, Carl Sagan's 85th birthday. He's the uh, one of the most well-known um, uh, astrobiologists, uh, astrophysicists, astronomers, uh, science communicators, science popularizers, um, and we celebrate his birthday on November 9th every year. We celebrate it because um, we have evolved. It's, it's a celebration of him as well as how we have uh, evolved, how we pointed out how we've evolved from this worldview where it's uh, you know heaven and earth and uh, the the old way of uh, the earth being the center of everything to something being out there really far away um, and putting ourselves um, in a more humbling uh, perspective to to step out of our uh, of our centrality and look at the universe as the gorgeous uh, vast expanse that it is. So uh, I will now have um, our president, uh, Alex Holtbinder, to uh, introduce our speaker, uh, Dr. David Eichheiser. Hi, I'm Alex Holtbinder, the president of the Secular Society of MIT, and it's my pleasure to introduce uh, Dr. David Kaiser. Um, Dr. Kaiser is the uh, Germanshausen Professor of the History of Science and Professor of Physics at MIT. He is the author of several award-winning books on the history of modern physics, including How the Hippies Saved Science, uh, Science, Counterculture, and the Quantum Revival, um, which focused on early efforts to understand strange phenomena like quantum entanglement, and was named Book of the Year by Physics World magazine. His latest book, Quantum Legacies, Dispatches from an Uncertain World, will be published in spring 2020. Uh, Dr. Kaiser co-directs a research group on early universe cosmology with Alan Guth in MIT's Center for Theoretical Physics, and has also designed and helped conduct novel experimental tests of quantum theory. A fellow of the American Physical Society, Kaiser has received MIT's highest awards for excellence in teaching. His work has been featured in Science, Nature, The New York Times, and The New Yorker magazine. His group's recent efforts to conduct a quantum bell test of quantum entanglement were featured in a documentary film, Einstein's Quantum Riddle, which premiered on PBS in January. Let's all give uh, Dr. Kaiser a warm welcome. 
Thank you so much. Can you hear me okay? Is the microphone helping at least reasonably? All right. Thank you. Uh, it's really a great, great pleasure and honor uh, to be here uh, this evening and to help us all celebrate uh, Carl Sagan's birthday. Uh, we just had a, a, an invocation of the memory of, of Sagan uh, much better than I can reproduce now. That Hail Blue Dot animation uh, uh, was marvelous. But I do want to note, as the organizer just noted, that this is uh, pretty close in time to Sagan's birthday. He would have been 85 years old uh, this year. Uh, and I've been thinking about Sagan and his, his influence on me very personally, very narrowly in my own little uh, orbit for quite some time. His really renowned series, Cosmos, first aired in, began airing in September of 1980 when I was nine years old. Uh, and I remember these very, very clearly and vividly. Uh, I remember especially watching um, the episodes each week with my father in particular. Uh, I found this on, on uh, the web this afternoon. This is an amazing historical artifact of something called the TV Guide, which some members of the audience will have heard of and others will have no idea what that means. This was, um, if you can imagine, a weekly print magazine that would come out to tell you all the programs you'd ever hope to watch on one of at least four channels. It was unbelievable information this thing would contain. Uh, and, you, and there was no streaming and no DVR, and you're going to watch it when they show it. So we would get up and we'd be, make sure we had the TV on to our local PBS station right on time each Sunday because we weren't about to see it some other time if we wanted to. Uh, around the same time, I think for my next birthday, I got a gift of the, the print edition, the book edition uh, by Sagan that went along with of the series, and it's still a treasured uh, artifact in my home, dog-eared and tattered and, uh, and, and really uh, much loved over the years. So I'm really just uh, especially glad to be able to talk to you this evening about some more recent cosmic adventures, but taking the opportunity to, to really honor uh, what Sagan's uh, inspiring message meant to a very young me, and, and I think it's worth returning to even today. Okay. So I want to talk about what really is a group effort. Here's a picture of uh, the research group that I organized with Alan Guth. This gentleman bears more than passing resemblance to a gentleman here in the front row. That's Alan. Uh, Alan uh, has been my mentor for a very long time, so much so that I even now sort of dressing like him inadvertently. That's a bad sign. You know it's time to move on at that point. Uh, this was uh, how our group looked a couple of summers ago. We uh, started the group uh, in, in September a number of years ago. And at the end of that first academic year, we had many, many students dying over the summer. And, and uh, they worked with us. Several of these smiling faces were undergrads at the time. Uh, some PhD students and postdocs and Alan Lee. That first summer, the summer of 2012 for our group, was particularly exciting. It turns out uh, this became uh, news even in the New York Times when Alan was one of the first recipients of what was then a brand new prize, the first time it had been offered. Then it was called the Fundamental Physics Prize, and now it's called the Breakthrough Prize. This was uh, inaugurated by a very wealthy um, philanthropist who had studied physics early in his life and had gone a different direction and made a lot of money by going in the direction, and Google's the money. And this individual decided that the better known big prizes in the world for achievement in fields like physics, that the prize committees were a little too staid or a little too slow to honor the really most influential work. So this gentleman said that he will just start giving $3 million prizes to people he thought were most deserving, uh, had done most to advance the field. And Alan was among those very first recipients that summer of 2012. Uh, Alan's here so you can correct the story, but this is how I remember having heard, heard him describe it many times. This prize had never been given before, no one had heard of it. Alan got an email out of the blue saying, Dear Dr. Guth, I really admire your work. I would like to give you $3 million. Please just send me your bank routing number and your account numbers. And I don't know about you, I get those emails all the time, and I just delete them. Alan luckily uh, said yes. So uh, after this news broke, uh, we had this large group over the summer. I talked about the, the news with my uh, wife, Tracy. How can we mark this occasion? And so with Tracy's help, I decided to order a big cake, a sheet cake, to feed all these very hungry cosmologists. And again, talking with Tracy, we realized here would be an, an, uh, an adequate inscription, a telling inscription for that cake. Uh, and so you can't quite see it here, so I blur it up here. The cake, uh, the very baffled baker agreed to write on 10 to the minus 36 equals 3 times 10 to the 6. I want to warn you, this is what passes for humor in the Center for Theoretical Physics. But I'll unpack now with the course this evening why I thought this was just hilarious. And I hope you'll enjoy the joke by the end of the lecture, if not by the beginning. Uh, as I will uh, I'll get us to over the course of the presentation, uh, the real thrust of the work that Alan uh, really helped set in motion, our new understanding of the earliest moments of cosmic history, really concerns processes, physics that happens on a natural time scale about 10 to the minus 36th of a second. That's a billion, 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 billionth fraction of a second. 
And it's a kind of physicist geek word scramble. Just take the same numbers and make them into three million, which was the dollar amount that Alan, in fact, did win. It wasn't just spam from that point. So I want to unpack how we get to this kind of exciting moment and some of the even more recent work in the field since then. One of the questions that animates our group, and in fact, many, many groups now, really all around the world, many, many centers of research on this, is one way of asking, not quite why are we here, but maybe part of the answer of how are we here. And by that we mean, why is there a structure to the universe? When astronomers gaze out of the cosmos, like in that beautiful pale blue dot uh, animation we just, we just saw, they can measure structures, real distinct um, features in the universe across an enormous range of distances or length scales. On some of the very largest scales, clusters and even so-called superclusters of galaxies, where there's big, thick concentrations of stuff, lots of energy and activity and, and motion, and then separated by enormous voids where not much seems to happen. We see that if we zoom into closer, uh, smaller distances, like the size of an individual galaxy, like the beautiful Andromeda galaxy. We can keep zooming in closer to home. Here's an artist's uh, conception, not quite to scale, of our own solar system. There's blobs and lumps and then voids. And even we can bring it down to, to our own beloved Cambridge, centers of immense energy and activity like here at MIT, and enormous voids where nothing ever happens like at Harvard Square. So, <laughs> so from, the, from the super galactic right down to our own uh, backyard, scientists measure structure, right? There's features that they are not uh, perfectly smooth. Now, how does that structure evolve? How do we get to, uh, to live in a place that has useful lumps, so matters not entirely smoothly distributed? We can get a lot of way there by invoking gravity. Gravity is really the most aristocratic of forces. The, rich is, the rich really do get richer. So if for some reason there had been some tiny, tiny unevenness, some uh, inhomogeneity or unevenness in this distribution of matter and energy at very early times, then over time, gravity would accentuate those minor differences. <laughs> so the areas that happen to have slightly more stuff per volume, a little more matter and energy than average, would attract more and more, more uh, matter and energy would glom into that region. And you can imagine building up structures that eventually become even uh, astrophysical in scale. And conversely, those regions that happen to have slightly less stuff per volume, a little under dense for some as yet unknown reason initially, those become more and more evacuated as the neighboring kind of rich hotspots attracted more stuff. So we can get a lot of the story of this huge range of structures from human scale all the way up to supergalactic by invoking gravity. But you notice I had to cheat there. I said, if for some reason there was some initial set of primordial initial lumps that we hadn't yet accounted for, then gravity could accentuate those over time. So a large part of what we're after is where do those initial lumps come from? How can we account for this amazing cascade of structure? What were the initial ingredients or lumps to get us there over cosmic history? So we're going to have two main conceptual ingredients. It's actually amazing to me that we can get all that cosmic structure from basically two ingredients. Uh, and we're going to do a little work to put those ingredients together. The first main ingredient I want to mention is Albert Einstein's very beautiful general theory of relativity. His really, I think, his crowning achievement in science. Uh, it, was his, it became his theory of gravitation, that the phenomenon we would call gravity, Einstein says, should really be attributed to the local warping or distortions of space and time. That large masses like the sun will literally dent or distend the space and time around them. Smaller objects will move in as straight a line as they can in a space that's no longer itself flat. So gravity for Einstein really comes from this wobbly kind of trampoline of space and time. And our second main ingredient is our idea of what might fill such a wobbly space time. Our idea is about matter at its most fundamental. What are the basic building blocks of nature? What makes up all the matter we see, perhaps even all the matter we don't see, but whose presence we infer from things like gravitation? And that means lists of the fundamental particles from which we think most other things are made, the forces that uh, make them interact together, including some very exotic objects like the Higgs boson, which was also first found quite uh, dis definitively in that same summer of 2012, pretty recently, uh, and with enormous input from uh, teams here at MIT. So these two ingredients, how does uh, the stuff of space warp and bend in response to the types of matter that might fill it? We put those ideas together, and over the course of this presentation, I hope I'll convince you, we get uh, a remarkable story of cosmic history, including where we get these lumps, how structure itself could evolve over time. 
So let's now let's sit a little bit longer with this uh, first ingredient from Einstein. These are what's called the uh, field equations of Einstein's general theory of relativity. I'm fond of saying these are brief enough to tweet. This is a very compact expression. This, this has a lot of information in a pre very, very efficient, compact form. And we can read this really in, in, in two distinct ways. This side here is really the way of quantifying that warping. This is, includes things like gradients, directions of steepest descent. This is the shape of space. Uh, that is being bent like this trampoline. This helps us quantify the curvature of space-time. And on the other side, it's where the stuff is. It's the distribution of matter and energy, like a large bowling ball plopped in the middle of a trampoline or the sun in the midst of our solar system. And so we can say that warping space tells matter how to move, or the distribution of matter tells space how to curve. There's this intimate and very beautiful connection between them that Einstein first really pulled together just over a century ago. He found this form of the field equations uh, and presented them to the Prussian Academy of Sciences on the last Thursday of November to, uh, 1915. It was the 25th or something like that. We can look up which, which day was the fourth Thursday of November 1915. That's when Einstein presented this, these amazing results. Pretty soon after that, Einstein himself and soon a small circle of colleagues began applying those very same equations, but now not just to local physics like our own solar system with the curvature of space and time near our sun, but trying to imagine cosmic modeling with these same set of equations. Einstein and others like Alexander Friedman and George Lemaitre and, and soon others began realizing that they could model entire universes with the same framework. And they began to realize that not only could space locally have a shape to it, a kind of distorted or, or curved shape, but the whole shape of the universe could be uh, curved back on itself in some closed geometry, like the surface of a sphere. That would be consistent with these, with these equations. Or the whole universe might actually open up away from itself in its hyperbolic shape. It's called an open geometry. Or indeed, there could be a flat geometry where right? each, uh, each slice of space would look like just the geometry that we all learned in high school, what we now would call Euclidean geometry. That any of these geometries, these kinds of shapes of space overall, could be consistent with its framework uh, from Einstein's general theory of relativity. Soon after that, not too long into this new game of trying to model whole universes with Einstein's equations, some new and very uh, exciting empirical data began to change the conversation. Uh, here's a photograph of Edmund Hubble, a famous uh, US-based astronomer with what was at the time one of the single largest telescopes on the planet. It's been since uh, dwarfed many times over. But beginning in the late 1920s, and published first in 1929, he and a series of assistants found what, they, what would soon be taken to be evidence that our own universe was expanding. Not only could there be a shape to space at any given moment in time, the universe might change over time. There could be a stretching, an expansion of space. Objects at one moment were relatively close to each other could move further and further apart from each other. And that's how uh, data light couples were, were, uh, came to make sense to the people who were already thinking in terms of Einstein's equations, like George Lemaitre. Now we run that forward nearly a century of an amazing array of new tools, techniques, and uh, places to observe from, from the South Pole, from the highest mountains in South America, and even above the atmosphere with things like the Hubble Space Telescope, named, of course, in honor of Edmund Hubble. So we have many, many things to look at, and many, many ways of looking. And over the nearly century since that time, more and more evidence has accrued that the universe is actually changing over time. It is expanding. It's getting bigger and bigger. Uh, so it has a shape in a given moment. It could have a shape. And it uh, is dynamic looking change over time. So that then leads to the question, how long has this expansion been going? In another way of asking this sort of how old is the universe itself, there's a lovely popular book by an astronomer, uh, David Weintraub, you might enjoy, called How Old is the Universe? Uh, and just to cut to the chase, we know the answer. It's 13.8 billion years. It's still worth reading one job. Book. It's a wonderful book. How do we piece that evidence together? What kinds of objects are observed? And how do we uh, glean facts from those observations? But the upshot is we can now date the age of the universe with what I would consider pretty surprising um, accuracy. So the universe has been expanding for nearly 14 billion years. One of the first people to think along these lines, whose name I already mentioned briefly, was this gentleman, George Lemaitre. He was meeting with Albert Einstein uh, in the 30s. Lemaitre was a Belgian mathematical physicist. He was also, as you might have seen from the, from the photograph, he was an ordained Catholic priest. He was with his clerical collar. Uh, perhaps most important in this room, Lemaitre did his PhD at MIT in the 1920s. We should, should and can claim him as one of our own. 
Lemaitre was very in, excited to use Einstein's equations to model a universe that might have a shape and might change over time. And he was actually very attuned to Hubble's data and what it might imply. He even sort of predicted that effect before Hubble even really went out and found evidence in support of it. And Lemaitre pretty soon in this game began wondering about what that might imply about very early times in cosmic history. He began uh, introducing a notion he called the primeval atom, the hypothesis, you can say, hypothesis in the origin of the universe. And the basic idea was the following. If the universe is expanding today, as Hubble's own data uh, quickly seemed to suggest, and more and more data since then, if the universe is expanding today, then it must have been smaller in the past. You imagine running that film loop backwards, something that looks like it's stretching now would appear to have been squeezing, squeezing as you run backwards to early and earlier times. And so the major wondered to run that to its extreme, must it be the case that our universe began in a very hot, dense state and has been expanding ever since? And that earliest moment he called the primeval atom. This would come to be called uh, the Big Bang picture. So uh, that was more or less where the picture had, um, had, had gotten to by the, um, uh, into the 1930s. Uh, and then by the early 1940s, or even late 30s in, in uh, much of Europe, uh, the, much of the world was engulfed in the Second World War. Uh, that led to an enormous amount of work on many kinds of projects, including by many, many scientists and engineers, much of it here at MIT with, uh, with uh, radar, the famous Manhattan Project developing uh, the first nuclear weapons. And after those really quite dramatic events of the, uh, throughout the late 30s and into the 40s, a few groups, not many, but a few groups of researchers after the end of the war came back to some of those same questions, the questions that had animated Einstein, uh, Georges Lemaitre, Edwin Hubble, and their small uh, circle of colleagues. Now those groups were armed with a whole lot more information about how atoms and even nuclei behave. Some of it gleaned from the nuclear weapons project, others gleaned from a host of research that had gone on really after Lemaitre set these ideas in motion. So they could reconsider what might it be like to imagine the state of the universe that was very different from what we live in today. A universe that was very different then than now, had been changing ever since, and to put themselves in the mind of those very extreme conditions of the sort the nature had wondered about, a very hot, very dense early state, very high temperature. They asked a series of questions. I should say that I'm highlighting two groups here that were working quite independently. One group was very quick out of the gate, led really by George Gamow, who was shown with his ghost-like appearance coming out of this bottle of Cointreau. That was a joke, because people, some people thought he drank too much. But here's uh, Gamow emerging from the bottle of booze, working closely with two uh, very gifted younger physicists, Robert Herman and Ralph Alpher. They were working very soon after the end of the Second World War, in the late 1940s, to, to build on, but really extend quite a bit beyond Lemaitre's picture of a primeval atom. And then independently, almost 15 years later, really in, in a kind of mutual uh, ignorance of this earlier work, a very active group began working on similar questions based at Princeton, led by uh, Robert Dickey, and one among several very active grad students then was James Peebles. Uh, you might know Peebles' name because just last month he uh, shared this huge Nobel Prize in physics for the kind of work that I'm going to describe right now. So each of these groups are asking these kinds of questions about this very early universe, when the universe uh, should have been very hot and dense. So at those early times, the universe would have been so hot that the average temperature was such, the, sort of, the, the, the environment was such, that individual photons, individual little particles of light, would on average carry so much energy that they would kind of blast apart. The, uh, any time the charged particles, like protons and electrons, might have begun to bond to make neutral hydrogen atoms. So the simplest form of matter, the, the first entry on Mendeleev's periodic table, is a hydrogen atom, which ordinarily consists of a single proton in the nucleus, a single electron uh, captured around it. And the idea was that at early enough times, the ambient temperatures, the environment in which these charged particles would have uh, found themselves, was simply not conducive to allow them to form stable, electrically neutral hydrogen. It really was like every time they began attracting each other with their electrostatic attraction, some beam of light would blast them apart because the average energy of each individual beam of light, each particle of light, was stronger than their binding energy. They couldn't form neutral hydrogen. These are the kinds of questions that, that each of these groups began wondering about in the context of Lemaitre's evolving universe. So at these early times, photons, these particles of light, are basically trapped. The universe is opaque, and it's filled with this plasma of charged particles. So charged particles 
love to bounce, scatter, and absorb little uh, particles of light. So it's like soccer balls on a dense field. The photons can never go very far before bumping into yet another bare charged particle. The particles are, are bare because they can't yet form electrically neutral hydrogen atoms. They could go on and calculate how long that kind of situation should persist. They had the idea, again, coming even from early studies by Lemaitre and some other colleagues before the war, that the average temperature inside that universe, that expanding universe, the temperature should drop as the size of the universe got bigger, much like the temperature of a gas inside a balloon will fall as the balloon expands, the volume of the balloon expands. So they could now begin to say this process should happen only for a certain period in cosmic history. That for temperatures above about 10,000 degrees Kelvin, not any arbitrary temperature, but temperatures above a particular value, the average uh, energy packed by an individual photon would overwhelm this binding energy of hydrogen atoms. And that corresponded to early times in cosmic evolution, from the arbitrarily hot early stage through almost 400,000 years of stretching of space, temperatures would have remained above that threshold. However, at around at this calculable moment, this is the modern value, but their, their early estimates were, were um, it was the same style of reasoning they followed, but as we now update with our new measurements, at, at a particular moment in cosmic history of around 380,000 years after this early primeval state, the uh, universe has expanded enough, the average temperature has fallen enough, that the energy packed by an individual photon no longer is enough to upset this, uh, this hydrogen atom from forming. So only after this time, when the temperature is falling to below ten, roughly 10,000 degrees, would the electric attractive force of the proton electron begin to win out because the ambient temperature of the universe has fallen because the universe is expanding. So only at that time, starting at that time, would the universe be transparent. Light could now travel large macroscopic distances because most of the universe is now filled with electrically neutral matter a bath of hydrogen atoms rather than the charged plasma of these bare charges. So now light begins to stream freely. It's no longer constantly blocked by these charged particles. The universe continues to expand, and so their wavelength continues to stretch. They, the average energy carried by each of those photons continues to fall. We know the energy they had when they first began to travel freely. We can now estimate by the means that, uh, that uh, David Weintraub explains in his recent book, we know how long the universe is expanding since that time. So we can calculate what the average energy should be of those photons that have basically been streaming freely through the universe for the better part of 14 billion years. And so they, both of those groups predict with remarkable accuracy given the early numbers they had to work with, that the universe today should be filled not with a very hot bath, but in fact a very, very low energy cool bath of this remnant radiation, which is a kind of heat glow from the Big Bang that we now call the cosmic microwave background radiation. And in fact, it should have a temperature in the modern uh, estimates that should be just below three degrees Kelvin. So this radiation first begins to stream with an average temperature of about 10,000 degrees Kelvin. And over the next almost 14 billion years, that mostly just does nothing but stream through empty space or through electric and neutral space anyway, until we should see this remnant bath today. Now that still might sound pretty abstract to you. This is how I like to think about it. I like to imagine a dance party. I don't, it turns out, attend many dance parties. That, that's just a fact. But this is what the internet tells me they would look like if I ever got invited to one. So this, I'm, I'm working at a distance here. Imagine very early in cosmic history, right at the beginning of this super uh, exciting dance party, the DJ is playing very exciting, very high tempo music. And everyone's just dancing in a kind of random chaotic order. That's like these average conditions very early at very high temperatures. If you tried to cross that room like this, uh, like this lonesome photon, you wouldn't get very far. You're going to scatter off all kinds of people dancing in a, in a chaotic, unorganized manner. If the DJ who runs that party knows what she's doing, then after a while she'll put on some slow music. And people begin to couple up, like in the Yule Ball at Harry Potter. Uh, and so at a calculable moment in that history of that dance party, the average temperature in the room, the energy of the dance music, is going to change. And at that moment, you could walk rather easily across the crowded dance floor, light begins to stream freely through the universe, because there's been a transition in the average conditions throughout the universe. If that helps clarify things for you, that's great. And if not, um, maybe I'll see you on the dance floor. Anyway, okay, let's move on. This was predicted twice independently, uh, both by uh, Gamow and his colleagues, and then later by uh, Jim Peebles and uh, Robert Dickey. Uh, and it was actually found 
right around the same time as that Princeton group made their second independent prediction. It was found by, uh, by quite accidentally by these researchers, Robert Wilson and Arno Penzias. They were both working at, not at Princeton, but nearby at Bell Labs in Holmdale, New Jersey, not too far from Princeton. They were working with this, at the time, quite modern, very large uh, radio antenna uh, receiver. This had been built by Bell Labs for the new space age. This was to help communicate with this brand new thing called Earth orbiting satellites. It's just a few years into the space age. And then after a few years, the labs let the astrophysicists like Wilson and Penzies use it for other kinds of measurements of uh, phenomena around our um, uh, galaxy. So they were trying to, to, to calibrate this new antenna for a new wave of experiments that had nothing to do with the Big Bang or the cosmic microwave back radiation. And as the story goes, as they each uh, recounted uh, many times in their own uh, telling, that they could cool this thing down and get this thing to a very clean signal, uh, but they couldn't get rid of, a, of, of an annoying residual hum. That there was some hum in their receiver that they couldn't account for, they could check the electronics, they could uh, recalibrate um, uh, other components. At one point, one of them, I'm not sure which one, one of these soon to be Nobel laureates, climbed the antenna to he by hand manually scoop out pigeon droppings, which they called um, strange dielectric material, which really just meant pigeon poop. Uh, but was that messing up their electronics? It was not. The hum wouldn't go away. It turns out a, a mutual colleague put them in touch with the Princeton group, saying that's not actually a problem with your instrument. You have measured the residual hum of the Big Bang itself. They were measuring that predicted yet not yet seen cosmic microwave radiation with an average energy of those photons right around three degrees above absolute zero. That was found uh, and published in 1965, and this very quickly brought an enormous amount of attention and interest among many, many physicists and astronomers to these questions of the evolution of the universe to this evolving Big Bang model, and so on. <clears throat> Now, we're here to honor uh, Carl Sagan. One of Sagan's favorite phrases, as I'm sure you may even know, is billions and billions. He had these kinds of things in mind. Once we're talking about evolution over 14 billion years, or a stretchy space that's been stretching to distances of tens of billions of light years, it gets pretty awkward to keep using units like meters and seconds, like that astronomical cosmic times and distances. So to make it a lot more convenient to handle those kinds of scales in both time and space, it's become quite common in cosmology to adopt a more convenient set of coordinates. We could always translate back to meter sticks and seconds on our watch, but it's a lot easier to work in these other coordinates for much of our uh, calculations. Well, the most important thing is we introduce this thing called the scale factor. You can think of that as the sort of average radius of the universe at a moment in time. If the universe is expanding, then that factor A will get bigger at later times. That really is just taking into account this overall stretching of space. So that any two galaxies that might have had a certain distance between them at one point will have a greater distance between them at some later point, and we can take that into account with this overall stretching of space as the expansion, the first sort of empirical insights about which date back to Hubble's data. So we therefore can label a physical distance, the one we would measure with meter sticks, by taking into account this global stretching and some other distance we're going to call the co-moving distance. That lowercase r is not something we would necessarily measure reliably in meters uh, because our measurements would change at different moments in time. Instead, that's uh, the distance that we uh, can sort of hold fixed and let the overall universal stretching account for why, say, those two galaxies moved apart over time. So the co-moving distance doesn't get necessarily get really, really big. It stays some fixed number, and the physical distance we measure with meter sticks grows over time because it has this universal stretching factor, the scale factor of fun. We do a similar trick, it's only a little bit more complicated, a similar idea for how we measure time. Instead of just watching uh, our watch tick by with what we might call a little t, we introduce a different coordinate, it's often called tau, the Greek letter tau. This really just means we're going to change the rate of our clock, the rate at which it ticks, based on the expansion, the stretchingness of space over time. So we're going to have a variable rate clock. That sounds like it might be very confusing. It turns out to be really helpful. It's actually no different uh, than what we do all the time. This is really just a kind of what's called a conformal transformation or conformal mapping. We do this without even realizing it in our day-to-day -day lives when we take the, sh the, the, the curved surface of the Earth and stretch it out into a flat piece of paper in what's called a Mercator projection. This is a kind of conformal mapping. This introduces a certain distortion that we're now quite used to. 
the land mass of Antarctica is not actually much larger than all of Eurasia. Right? That's a distortion of our map. But that's the price we pay for not having to carry a sphere in our pocket all the time. We can actually handle a flat mapping. So we make some distortions that we can take into account. We know how to, how to go back and forth in our coordinates. And it buys us an enormous amount of convenience. That's what we're doing now with space and time. We're doing this, this conformal stretching. So the amount of stretching changes as we've discussed different epochs in the universe's history. But it's really just like unfurling our map into a Mercator projection. So here's what it would look like in our special coordinates of what's called conformal time and co-moving distance. Why do we do that? Because now, even though the universe has been stretching, it's been stretching at different rates over time, with this really uh, confusing uh, shape if you try to draw it in, in units like meters and seconds. But when we use these more convenient coordinates, things snap sort of back into place. And in particular, light rays now travel uh, simply on just 45 degree diagonals. They might have had a very complicated traversal through a, 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 a universe expanding at different rates. We take that into account with our coordinates, and now it makes light look exceptionally simple. That's like having the ease of putting the Earth on a two-dimensional uh, projection. Now, I went through all that. Most, as you can keep in mind, is universal stretching of the scale factor. Keep that in mind for the next part. A few years into this great success of the Big Bang model, that one of those same pioneers I mentioned, Robert Dickey, introduced what became known as a flatness problem. There were some cracks in the explanatory power of the Big Bang model, and one of the first and most surprising came from Dickey himself. I mentioned earlier that according to Einstein's equations of general relativity, there can be an overall shape to the universe. The, the space could curve back onto itself in that closed universe. It could open up away in that hyperboloid like a horseback riding saddle, or it could have the flat uh, and boring geometry of Euclid. It turns out, according to Einstein's equations, which shape you have depends on how much stuff is filling that space. Think back to Einstein's equations. The curvature of space and time is given by the, where the stuff is, the distribution of matter and energy. And so when you think about an entire universe, you have a, a, a relationship between the amount of stuff per volume, the density, and the overall shape. And in particular, if you have a universe that has more stuff per volume than some critical value, then that corresponds to this closed geometry. The universe will literally kind of attract itself back and close onto itself like the surface of that sphere. If you have less than the critical value, of less stuff per volume than this critical amount, then the universe will actually just open up away from itself in that hyperboloid shape. And only if you have this exact balancing that the actual amount of stuff per volume, the actual density of matter and energy in the universe, is exactly equal to this critical value that comes from Einstein's own equations, only then would you expect to have this flat geometry, the kind that we actually still study in high school. So far, so good. But then Dickey went on to say, using Einstein's same equations, that notion that omega would equal 1, a flat universe, we have exactly the critical amount of stuff per volume, that kind of Goldilocks solution, that's an unstable solution to Einstein's equations. Things should not stay there. In fact, things should move further and further away from a flat geometry over time. And in particular, we can work out the scaling that the deviation from a flat universe, the, the more and more it differs from the Goldilocks or flat case, should actually grow over time as the universe itself expands. We can work this out. This is for a universe filled with ordinary matter, like rocks and planets and stars, that uh, the scale factor should grow. The, vol the, the, uh, the density should be inverse, we might think, to the volume. It's the stuff per volume. The volume grows like the cube of the, um, of the scale factor. Think about you know, uh, length, breadth, and height. There are three dimensions of space. So you have a squared times 1 over a cubed. You get 1 over a up top. a is getting bigger over time, right? The universe is stretching, expanding over time. So the universe should look less and less flat over time. This became known as a flatness problem. And yet, even in the late 1960s and early 70s, when this question began being uh, considered, the astronomers knew that omega was maybe not exactly equal to 1, but it wasn't radically different from 1. It wasn't astronomically different from 1. So how could this be, in a universe that's been stretching for 14 billion years, that we see anything even remotely close to omega equals 1 today? This is a plot from Alan's popular book, um, where he went through the calculation. So if omega were different from 1 by one part in 10 to the 16th, if it were exponentially close to 1 at one second after Big Bang, at a time when there's other physical processes that the Big Bang model predicts that match observations impeccably well. We think we understand the physics of the universe at one second really well. That's already something to, to, to marvel at. If it was 
only off by this much at one second, it would be nowhere near one today. We, would look, we, we should live in a universe that looks nothing at all like the universe in which we find ourselves. That's the thrust of the flatness problem. That a flat universe should be less and less likely over time because we should deviate more and more from flatness as the universe stretches. That's a flatness problem. The second big problem is identified a few years later, actually again by people like uh, 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 Robert Dickey and, and James Peebles and others, and that became known as the horizon problem. We go back to our helpful, useful coordinates here, our, our conformal map. Remember, this is our, our time coordinate running up the page. Here's our co-moving distance we've taken out from the universe is stretching in space. And we go back to that incredible uh, remnant glow from the, from the early universe, the cosmic microwave background radiation. Well, here we are sitting in the middle of our plot. We're receiving signals from the sky from opposite sides of the sky. That light has been traveling towards us since the universe first became transparent, since the first electrically neutral hydrogen atoms began to form at some early time in cosmic history. And they've been traveling towards us, so we receive them today. Now that happened at a moment in time, at a moment in cosmic history, that we could calculate to be about 380,000 years after the Big Bang. That means there was some finite time between the beginning of everything, the Big Bang, and when that light began to travel. So we can, we can ask, how far could a single light beam have traveled, even if the universe wasn't filled with all that charged plasma, given the finite age of the universe up to that time? That's what we call the horizon distance. The idea is that light travels really fast, but not arbitrarily fast. Light travels at a fixed speed, at least according to Einstein's equations, an, an absolute upper speed limit. So if the universe is only so old, and light can only travel so fast, there's some maximum distance, we call that the horizon distance, that a single light beam, even in principle, could have traveled, given the time available to it. So if the universe began at the Big Bang, and the, the, the signal we received was emitted 400,000 years later, then there's a maximum distance, we call it the horizon distance, that a single beam of information of any kind could possibly have traveled. And it turns out, that the measurements of that CMB, the cosmic microwave background radiation, that people measure with greater and greater precision uh, over the last uh, half century, that signal is uniform to one part in 100,000. It's not just that the sky looks kind of the same here as there. They look indistinguishable to exponential accuracy. The, the energy, the frequency, the color of that light that we get from this side of the sky and that side of the sky is the same to one part in 100,000 even though, according to this Big Bang model, they were emitted from parts of the universe that had, didn't have time to exchange a single light beam yet by the time that signal was emitted. How could you coordinate to have such a uniform signal over distances that were many times, in fact, about 100 or more times larger than the maximum distance a single bit of information could have traveled in that time? So the, uh, the, the signal that we measure shows uniformity over a much, much, much greater distance than anything we account for in terms of any kind of physical interaction could have brought them into an equilibrium. I like, again, that sounds very abstract. I like to think of this as a fog experiment. Imagine if when you first walked into the room this evening, we had handed each of you a ping pong ball, we blindfolded you, put earplugs in, and took your cell phones. So we have to get human subjects approval. It's kind of now it's a nasty story because we don't have your phones with you. But imagine you can't communicate with each other. There's no prior plans. And we just say, when the spirit moves you, everyone should throw your ping pong ball at the exact same moment with the exact same speed to one part in 100,000, with no opportunity to plan or coordinate. Right? You can't communicate, you can't send a single tweet. There's not time for a single message to get from this side of the room to that side of the room. And yet, all these ping pong balls get launched at the same time with the same energy to exponential accuracy, with no way to coordinate. That's the thrust of the horizon problem. And again, the Big Bang has no way to account for this extraordinary uniformity. It tells us there should be a glow, there should be a remnant radiation, but how could it possibly be so remarkably smooth and uniform? That's the horizon change. Plus, remember how I started, where are those lumps? I said we can account for structure, including things like a rocky earth on which we will eventually evolve, if we put in some initial primordial lumps. Where'd those come from? So that's another complete, uh, completely absent in the usual Big Bang model, even though the model otherwise has so many exciting successes. So that's where we bring it come to Alan, who is uh, right on cue, asleep in the front row. And he'll probably wake up when I say that. Okay. Here's Alan, or there's Alan. Uh, here's a lovely book that he wrote uh, describing some of this stuff. Uh, let me see some. Uh, so in uh, just almost exactly 40 years ago, in fact, I know how close to 40 years ago it was, and I'll tell you in a moment. Alan was thinking about some of these questions. In fact, he heard a lecture by Bob Dickey talking about this flatness problem, which Dickey himself had helped introduce. 
Alan had not been trained in cosmology. He'd been trained in MIT, undergraduate, master's, and PhD, so he is a lifer. Uh, but his research in physics had been on the other side of our ingredients, on the matter side. He'd been, Alan, Alan had been studying high energy particle physics. And a few years after his PhD, he began thinking about what was by then quite a common thing to wonder about, or more and more common, about this Higgs field and how energy could get trapped in that field and might not be able to get relaxed arbitrarily quickly. So you can imagine drawing a kind of potential energy function for this more exotic state of matter, form of matter, like this Higgs field. What if there, what if there could be a configuration in which the field could get trapped at some non-zero value of potential energy, and it can't very rapidly roll down the hill. It wants to get to the minimum energy. This is the lowest energy state. It should eventually wind up there, at least according to our understanding of how these fields should behave. But it can't get there arbitrarily quickly. It's called a metastable state. If you've taken some quantum mechanics, you'll know, oh, well, maybe you could tunnel through that barrier. It certainly can. But it can't do that arbitrarily quickly. So we might have a universe in which it might be uh, filled with some Higgs-like matter that could at least for some amount of time be stuck, be stuck with some non-zero potential energy that it can't release or relax arbitrarily quickly. Now, how do I know we're just about 40 years on from this? Because Alan was keeping a notebook at the time. Here's a page from Alan's notebook. It was December 7th, 1979. That's less than one month. That's about three weeks from now will be the 40th anniversary. And I want to put my historian's cap back on for a moment and make a plea for all of the very creative and original people in the audience, all of you, when you're about to change our understanding of the universe, please, for us historians, write it down, date it, use it impeccably clean handwriting, put a box around it so we know you think it's important, and tell us why you think it's so great. If you call it spectacularization, we're especially likely to pay attention. It's amazing. This was, I'm sure, very early in the morning hours of December 7, 1979 where Alan had what he had told us in the ages, a spectacular realization. That's not my words, those are his words. And he was realizing that if it were possible for a universe to be filled or dominated by this kind of strange, more exotic particle physics kind of matter, this Higgs field, and if that Higgs field could be trapped in this metastable state where it had some potential energy that it couldn't really relax arbitrarily quickly, then that should lead to some very dramatic cosmic consequences. <laughs> when you go back to Einstein's field equations, and you plug in that kind of distribution of matter and energy, unusual, not the kind you'd ordinarily find when thinking about rocks and planets uh, or even protons and electrons, then if the energy density is staying this constant, can't, even for a, 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 a short moment in time, if it momentarily gets stuck, then that scale factor of the universe should grow exponentially quickly. The universe under those conditions won't just expand, it should accelerate, it should expand more and more quickly for the duration that the energy is trapped in this metastable state. This happens quite naturally with Higgs-like matter. This does not happen, uh, at least not in any ordinary scenarios, with other kinds of more common matter like protons or quarks or electrons. Right around that time, or soon after that, a whole uh, a widening circle of colleagues began thinking of other ways to produce these inflating states. Uh, many of them were thinking about uh, different kind of scenarios of Higgs, uh, Higgs potentials. Uh, like Andy Albrecht and Paul Steinhardt, that you might you could get away with a different kind of uh, potential energy shape for a Higgs-like field, not just that very particular one that had first caught Alan's attention. Uh, Alexei Starobinsky and separately Andre Linde began asking other questions about how you could, might get the universe into this uh, inflating state. And in fact, it was really uh, Linde himself who I think really showed just how general such a state could be. That in fact, you don't need any particular, or you need very few special conditions on the shape of that potential energy function. You don't need a divot and a center, you don't need a particularly flat middle. Uh, that in fact, if we think about how that matter will evolve, that Higgs like field will evolve, while space around it is stretching, that creates a kind of friction. It's almost like it's rolling in a bowl, but we've rubbed the sides of the bowl with molasses. So the field won't find its minimum arbitrarily quickly, even if we don't have a special or funky shape to the potential. And so uh, through a, a whole bunch of work all coming out in the early 80s, a number of uh, lines of investigation suggested that they should, this kind of inflating or exponential growth of the universe should be something we actually expect to have happen at very early times when these other kinds of matter, like a Higgs field, would have dominated most of the energy in the universe. Now, why does that help us with these challenges of the Big Bang model that I articulated a few moments ago? Let's go back to that flatness problem. The universe, remember, according to the ordinary Big Bang model, should look less and less flat over time if it's expanding. 
That was if it's filled with a kind of typical form of matter or radiation. If instead we have one of these um, inflating states where the energy density is staying nearly constant or changing very slowly, while the universe itself is stretching, then look what happens to this difference between uh, omega and this critical value of one. Instead of getting bigger over time, during inflation, the universe gets big really quickly, and the density stays nearly constant. So we have one over a number that very rapidly gets big. One over a big number is a very small number. So in fact, the universe should have been driven to look flat to us, even if it started with some arbitrary or different curvature at early times. Inflation gives a mechanism, a physical dynamics, that should drive the universe to look flat today, even if it didn't start out as flat. We don't have to assume that it was flat at early times. Now, when I entered graduate school about 25, 26 years ago, I was already excited about this and wrote my senior thesis on this stuff. I really <clears> had <throat> done very little with my life uh, since the early 90s. Um, uh, but I got to grad school, and some very otherwise very friendly astronomers were on my dorm hallway uh, as a grad student dorm. And like, you're working on inflation. Everyone knows Omega's not one. What kind of idiot are you? They were, they, were, they were only slightly less mean than that. Why would you work on this model? We know the universe isn't flat. We've measured omega to great accuracy, and it's 0.3. Why would you worry about this? Well, it turns out more recent measurements have been conducted. Omega is not around one. It's only not 0.3. It's one to extremely high accuracy, putting many of those same astronomers. So uh, we can we can learn over time. This was results from the International uh, Planck Collaboration released their most recent uh, analysis of their data released just last year. Not only is omega close to one, but the latest high precision measurement showed that it is really, really close to one, fully consistent with what we'd expect from an inflation of the universe, very hard to make sense of without an early uh, phase of something like inflation. Let's go back to that second big hurdle, the horizon problem. Remember, that was the kind of unaccounted for smoothness or, or uh, uh, homogeneity of the cosmic microwave background. Uh, even though there seemed not to have been time to send even a signal, kind of a single coordinating signal across that expanse of space. But inflation suggests that we were actually starting our clock at the wrong time. There would have been time before what we had been calling the Big Bang. It was this time when that uh, matter was trapped in this Higgs like state, this metastable state. And so, in our convenient coordinates of these conformal time, we actually unfurl more time below what we had been calling t equals zero. This is the inflationary phase. And we make the same argument. Now there's been much more time than we previously accounted for, during which uh, a signal could have gotten from one side of the sky to the other, because there's more time to have let light beams travel. Remember, the, 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 the rub of the horizon problem is that the universe is only so old, so only so far light could have gotten based on that amount of time. If we said there was more time than we had previously accounted for, there's further that light beams could have traveled, at least in principle. There's a way in which this side of the sky could indeed have been in what we call causal contact with that side of the sky long before that radiation was emitted. So now we've reversed the hierarchy of scales, which is a fancy way of saying what used to be too short is now long, what used to be really too long is now uh, shorter. The horizon distance is now comfortably longer, in fact it could be much, much longer, than the size of uniformity over which we measure this uniform signal. Now this looks pretty impressive on, in these conformal coordinates, remember that's that variable time rate clock. But remember, the, the, uh, the time rate here depends on the rate of stretching of space, we take that into account. And during inflation, this space is expanding exponentially quickly. So in these convenient coordinates, it looks like almost equal amounts of, of real estate below the line and above. But when we go back to the coordinates that you and I are used to, like seconds and hours uh, and days, we see this entire uh, extension before what we call the Big Bang lasts about 10 to minus 36 of a second. And if you're very lucky and a very rich donor wants to reward your work, they might rearrange the numbers into $3 million. That's where the 10 to 36 comes from. The entire inflationary phase in our human units in seconds lasts unbelievably quickly, a billion, 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 billionth of a second. And yet because space is stretching so violently during inflation on these more convenient coordinates, that accounts for all this extra real estate. During that same extremely brief window of time, the scale factor, the size of space, stretches by about 30 orders of magnitude. That's an enormous stretch. Here it is in more familiar coordinates. Uh, what we thought of in the, in the usual extrapolation for Big Bang model gets amended by this gray inflationary phase. And so when we tell our stories backwards in time, the region of space that we now inhabit, or that we can receive signals from, started out much, much, much smaller than we previously thought. 
So light beams could easily traverse a much, much, much shorter distance, exponentially smaller distance, in the time available to it. That's, that's another way of, of solving the horizon, of discussing the horizon problem. Okay. So now what about the lumps? So far we can address now flatness and horizon. Why are we here? Why is there this uh, hierarchy of structure across a huge range of scales? This was realized pretty early on after those early models of inflation to give us the bulk properties. Many people uh, came to the, to the recognition that the universe was, in this model was filled with this Higgs-like matter. That matter, like all matter, should be subject to quantum mechanics. In particular, it should be subject to the uncertainty principle. I mean, for remember Heisenberg, uh, it's a so there should be an unavoidable jitter, an unavoidable quantum fluctuation in the state of that Higgs-like field. That's like saying the distribution across space of the matter and energy contained in that field can't be arbitrarily smooth. If it were arbitrarily smooth, that would violate the uncertainty principle. There must be some unavoidable residual jitter in the distribution of matter filling the universe uh, in that Higgs-like field. So we can go back and calculate not just the bulk motion of that system as it gently, slowly rolls down the side of its potential energy. We can also calculate the quantum jitters on top of it. How would space behave uh, in the midst of these quantum jitters as well as the bulk flow? We, can, uh, we realize that these gravitational effects both stretch space, uh, stretch the, uh, the, the wavelengths of those quantum jitters, and also changes their height compared to if we ignored gravity. And so what happens is these unavoidable quantum jitters with a characteristic wavelength get stretched along with everything else as the universe goes through this exponential stretching of inflation. The scale factor during inflation, as I mentioned, grows by about 30 orders of magnitude. That means the length scale of an average quantum fluctuation gets stretched by 30 orders of magnitude during that blink of an eye of inflation. That's the difference between the size of an atom and a galaxy. That brings us from quantum mechanical scales to astrophysical scales. That gives us an unavoidable, prim unavoidable primordial set of lumps that over time could then grow into the structure we see. How about we test that idea? That sounds very fantastical. How about we test that idea? One way is to go back to that amazing resource, the cosmic microevaporation. So here's a modern picture with false color imaging to exaggerate the differences in temperature at different points in the sky. This is blowing up so our eyes can see it. Remember, actually, it's uniform to one part in 100,000. So the photons that begin to stream freely once neutral hydrogen begins to form at that early moment in cosmic history, uh, that begins to move through a space that's already a little bit distended, a little bit shaken up by those primordial quantum fluctuations from inflation. It gets impressed in the kind of clay of space and time. So why does that impact the photons? Photons that happen to come from a particular region of space, that happen by chance to have a little bit extra matter and energy than average, that unavoidable fluctuations a little more energy density than average in that one location in space, that photon actually has to pay a little bit more energy to escape. It has to overcome the gravitational attraction to that lump of stuff. So it's lost a little bit of energy compared to the average value. We measure that photon as being a little bit lower energy, lower temperature than the average value. Correspondingly, photons that come from slightly under dense regions, which have a little less stuff per volume than average, based on those unavoidable quantum jitters, should have pay, uh, had to pay less than that average amount of energy to, to escape, so they would appear slightly hotter or warmer to us. We should see temperature anisotropies on the sky of a very particular pattern that was laid down by those primordial quantum fluctuations. We've now had three generations of satellites trying to measure that effect, uh, releasing the data roughly uh, 10 years apart. The first successful measurement uh, was the COBE satellite. One of the great leaders of that project was Ray Weiss here at MIT. They released that data in uh, 1992. Uh, I was a senior in college. My five professors and I had a champagne toast. We were seniors, so we could drink. Uh, this is what the average resolution looked like on the sky. About 10 years after that, in 1990, uh, me, 2003, a different NASA satellite called the WMAP satellite released its first data. They had an improvement of about 30, a power of 30 in improved resolution over that one decade of technological uh, advancement. And now you can begin to really um, resolve those hot spots, relative hot spots and cold spots on the sky. 10 years after that, in 2013, uh, the Planck collaboration, uh, supported primarily by the European Space Agency, released their first maps with another factor of about 30 improved resolution. So we can map these very tiny, very subtle lumps in, in the distribution of light on the sky with these generations of satellites. We can then plot those 
The uh, green line is basically the, the theoretical prediction from uh, the most straightforward, simplest models of inflation. The red circles are the empirical data points from the Planck group. In many of these cases, the error bars are actually uh, um, um, expanded so we can see them. You can see this unbelievable fit across a huge range of scales in the sky. We compare the temperature between two points in the sky that are very close to each other, all the way out to 90 degrees apart. We perform what's essentially a kind of Fourier transform of what we call the two-point function. Compare the average temperature here and here, here and here and here across a widening angular distance across, and put that into this kind of map. Compare that with the, with the green theoretical prediction. It looks amazing. Uh, so very briefly, uh, some of the work I've done with my own students in recent years is to calculate how we think that distribution should look from uh, more realistic models of early universe inflation. Maybe there should be more than one Higgs-like field interacting. There should be certain kinds of ways to interact with each other. And we find, uh, to our great delight, not only do we find results that look a lot like the data, but in fact there's a, what we call an attractor. So the predictions for how that map should look, this map here, the predictions for this, as we boil it down to some key characteristics of that spectrum, actually betray almost no dependence on the initial conditions of how inflation might have started or on the strength of the couplings between those fields. The, the, the predictions are remarkably robust across the whole family's models. Uh, the names here with the asterisks were Europe students, undergraduates working with me on some of these earlier calculations. Uh, more recently, again with, uh, with um, an undergraduate student and uh, some other colleagues, we were asking the question, would inflation start even if the universe were very lumpy at early times? What if before inflation started, there was a big mess uh, on very short distance scales? Would the universe nonetheless be able to start inflation in the midst of a messy initial condition, not a very kind of smooth one? And again, the answer is consistent with uh, uh, work from several other groups around the world, that indeed, yes, there could be enormous lumps across a huge range of scales that will get smoothed out uh, and remain small over time. And uh, most, most recently, again, working with several colleagues, trying to understand the mapping from that early inflationary phase back onto the standard Big Bang evolution. The Big Bang uh, assumes certain conditions about the whole universe. Inflation assumes very different conditions. How do we bridge the two? How do we retain the successes of the Big Bang model while bringing on these new successes from inflation? And again, the short answer is just taking into account how we know these Higgs-like fields should interact or how we uh, model them from high-energy physics. They should very efficiently at the end of inflation transfer their energy into many species of ordinary matter. That matter should behave uh, in the way that we expect for the Big Bang models to take hold. It should behave uh, on average like radiation. Uh, and uh, it should very rapidly come to a thermal equilibrium. All the conditions we need to start the Big Bang evolution should come quite naturally at the end of inflation on its own without putting anything new in. We have a quite smooth bridge from this exotic early phase of inflation into the more standard Big Bang evolution. So let me conclude. Cosmic inflation arises from types of matter and interactions that we really know exist, things like the Higgs boson, and it addresses several long-standing cosmic puzzles. Models of inflation make very specific quantitative predictions for what the universe should look like today, both on kind of bulk scales as well as on these very fine, uh, fine-grained, detailed predictions. And the simplest models fit these observations to a really astonishing accuracy. So why is the universe lumpy? Why, in that sense, are we here? Because space-time is wiggly and matter is jiggly. I have a very short coda. The organizers asked me to speak very briefly about this. Alan and I wrote a review article on these ideas 14 years ago, Alan, if you can realize, or believe that. 2005, for the 100th anniversary of Einstein's special theory of relativity. We wrote a very short and frankly boring, um, a rather straightforward review article on inflation. And about a week after our article came out, Alan was sent an email to the website. There was a point by point rebuttal of our review article on inflation and cosmology, posted on a, a kind of creationist uh, website. I won't go through all their critiques, and we can talk about those if you like, but they conclude this way. I couldn't help but share this with you. Their own conclusion in response to our articles, we have to show you in their own words what these MIT eggheads are saying. First of all, I was impressed. Some creations have very keen powers of observation. They got that part exactly right. The MIT eggheads part, that, that was the <laughs> Good thing Kaiser Nietzsche, they got truck driving, okay? That would get them out of their ivory towers at MIT and into the real world, where they would be forced to look at trees, mountains, weather ecology, and all the other observable things on our privileged planet that are inexplicable by chance 
Now this were claimed design, purpose, and intention, presumably by a creator. So I want to thank the organizers very much. I'll give one final shout out to Carl Sagan, but now I gotta interrupt. Thanks so much. <laughs> And um, now we'll do a uh, short Q&A session. So um, I think since it's somewhat tightly spaced, uh, people can just ask from their seats. So um, if anyone has questions, feel free to raise your hands. And what's convinced? <laughs> that, that graph that has those. Uh, yes. There are no adjustable parameters? Oh, there are. Oh, but, OK. But there aren't very many. Please tell us about them. It's a great question. Now, the point is that there are actually very few. Uh, and inflation makes predictions for, uh, for several of them, and there's not a lot of wiggle room left. And the, and the models give us a really uh, a remarkable fit to, to not just one parameter, but about four. Uh, so let me come back to, the, to this here. Um, that's right. So, so there's a lot of physics going on in the, in this, in the Thompson Nervo series. It's really a remarkable story. Uh, one of the most important has to do with the, basically the kind of slope over here, the kind of primordial tilt on the very longest light scales, the very widest angles on the sky. That's a number that actually is uh, encapsulated here, the, what's called the, the um, spectral index, we usually call it N. So you can see, I didn't say here, different models predict different values for N. We've got a, we've got a pretty tight range, but they all give the exact same value. That's actually a prediction from these models that then would change how that green line would, would look on this other plot. It would change a little bit uh, the, the, the specific features of this plot here, for example. So one thing you want to do is calculate the spectral index. Another thing you want to calculate is called the tensor scalar ratio. That's how large an amplitude should there be expected for gravitational waves, a different kind of jiggle in space, compared to these, which are these, uh, these scalar waves, the more like kind of pressure waves or sound waves. Uh, there's a ratio between those, and again, different models will predict different values. And so what I, what I was uh, maybe going too quickly over to say, what I like about this particular family of models is they predict values right in the sweet spot of the present observations. There are other parameters than two or three others. The signal should be what we call adio mostly adiabatic, mostly uh, Gaussian. These are ways of characterizing that signal. We're taking a spectrum of a complicated signal, and there are different characteristics of that that we should be able to read out from the data are they consistent with what we would predict sort of from first principle for our models? And these simple models nail sort of many of those uh, uh, points, not just one or two. Uh, there are some overall things. So one thing that is free to adjust is basically the overall height. So we, the overall amplitude we normalize from the earliest observations. So the, the height of this, this is actually a dimensionful quantity. How strong is that signal could have floated in principle and, uh, and so that we take as an input to our models to predict the, some of the other things, for example. So it's a, a bit of a back and forth. But there are very few uh, um, uh, genuinely free parameters. That is what's often called the lambda CDM model. And so to get the whole spectrum, not just the beginning part that sets it all on the right track, but to get to match all these features, you have to uh, have a certain amount of what's called dark energy, the sort of residual energy of empty space, a certain proportion of what's called dark matter compared to ordinary matter, that's a ratio. We can uh, read that out by the relative heights of some of these peaks. Um, you need, what else do you need? You need, uh, well, then you need things like the spectrum and so on. So not very many inputs to get this entire spectrum across, really, you know, the whole sky. It's, it's, it's a pretty tightly constrained system. It's, uh, I find that correct. I mean, when, when I was a senior in college, people had basically found this. Uh, in 2003, people had found this, this, and this. And the plot group found all these lower so-called acoustic peaks. And that just is, it, it's amazing to me that these, those are even observable in the sky, let alone they match, the continue to match so, so beautifully well. Thank you. Sure. Yeah, please. So thank you for, for your uh, very interesting speech. So I have just a very, maybe, uh, dumb uh, question. Like, sure. uh, is there a way that we can understand the topology of our universe? Is it kind of like a homomorphic to a sphere or to a or something else? Yes, it's a great question. So, so there's a way that you can try to pose that question empirically as well. Uh, and I've had colleagues who have asked that question. So um, these models assume that our universe has a trivial topology and in fact have um, no overall curvature. Remember, inflation says it should be a, 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 a Euclidean geometry and basically a trivial topo 
One could imagine, what if the whole universe was, you know, spatially flat but of finite size and maybe had, like, repeating cells? What if there were kind of unit cells that got repeated? Or a torus, or if there was something like periodic boundary conditions? That, if, if the size of that unit cell were, were, were not arbitrarily large, that would show up as distortions, that would show up as a different pattern in this very plot. So we, can, we can't say we know for sure we live in a, in a trivial topology, we can say we can constrain any departures from a trivial topology uh, by only being no, no smaller than such and such, than uh, what we might call the, the, the present uh, Hubble radius. And that means we can't live in a very tiny torus, or something with very tight curvature, or, or uh, the kind of unit cell can't be arbitrarily small, because it would actually modify what we'd see here. So that's where we can begin to use this amazing amount of data from the CMB um, to, to constrain other kinds of possibilities that would otherwise have been consistent with Einstein's uh -huh. equations. But they don't show up with these kinds of measure. Good question. Yeah, please. It's a pretty silly question. Yeah. Why is it not a circle? Oh, uh, for, for viewing ease. In fact, it's not silly at all. The same team has actually made circles. Uh, they made a, a circular uh, mapping as well. This is just, you know, it's again like you can imagine maps of the Earth that might show certain features as you exaggerate certain kind of projections. This is just a particular projection of the sky. Um, but you're right, one could absolutely have made it a kind of. A, Fear of light surrounding us as well. Um, and people have made those kinds of visualizations as well. Yeah. No particular reason. None that I know. Well, I think this this map thing has I think equal area for equal area of sky. Uh, if you yes, made it a circle, right. you'd have the North Pole. Right. That's right. So the not to be You can't have the Earth is near on paper without distorting distances. So it's another trade-off like that Mercator projection, a slightly different choice yeah. to, to, to feature other things, um, but it's a choice to make. Yeah. yeah. Does dark energy and dark matter have any, it brings any additional knowledge of information to inflationary theory or vice versa? It, or are it, these completely independent? Yeah, it's a great question. So that's an ongoing challenge, to be perfectly honest. So part of our work in, that I mentioned near the very end when the, when the one type of matter, or the few types of matter that likely dominated the universe at very early times during inflation, that has to relax into a whole bunch of stuff. It has to relax, it has to decay into the stuff that's ultimately going to make us and planets and stars and galaxies. That's what we would call, say, the ordinary particles of the standard model of particle physics. And that includes mundane things like electrons and quarks. It could include exotic particles like uh, excited states that are found in accelerators. All that stuff has to come from this phase. And also, it would be nice if the dark matter would come from this process as well. One could make models like that, but it's hard to constrain them. So we can, we can put that into a model. It's hard to say that model is right and this was wrong. So we know, in that sense, we know what answer it, we have to get to at the end of that process. We know that by long before the CMB, there has to be a certain proportion of dark matter to all the ordinary matter. And we have some constraints of oh, when that had to be sort of injected into the universe. But how, at what exact time, at what process, that really we don't know. So we can make models and say, is that, would that mess other things up if it went that way? It's hard to say, ah, we found it. So the challenge of dark matter is, is a very, quite substantial one, and dark energy likewise. In these very early uh, times of cosmic history, the, the energy, energy that would have driven cosmic inflation uh, is very, very, very different in scale from the residual energy of empty space that people can measure today, which we now call dark energy. Presumably, energy of empty space. There are just really, really different scales. So it's not like that it's the same exact processes that would have driven early universe inflation and late universe acceleration people measure now. Are they related in some way? Maybe, but so people can cook up models, say, does it mess other things up? Does it bias any explanatory power? That remains another big, frankly, big open challenge. Characterizing where does the stuff come from? Why does it have the amount that it seems to have? What role might have been played in earlier epics? Yeah. Is the universe uh, flat everywhere, or is it uh, different? You know, you have places where it's closed, places where it's open. Right. So that's a great question. That, that's I. I think we can think about it along the lines of the topology question. This is simple. Yeah. And at least on the scales that we can probe with the CMB, which is uh, what we can call the observable universe, which is out to something like depending on how you count, sort of like 90 billion light years in each direction. Uh, there's no signs, no, no compelling signs of deviation from flat. 
Hmm. Now, it might have some radical strange curvature beyond what we can see, beyond, you know, on length scales even longer than what's probed by these wiggles, but we don't know. Uh, one can make all kinds of models and speculations where there might be all kinds of sort of features on much, much, much longer length scales, and we are literally blind to them. Mm -hmm. So we don't know. Yeah? Um, and is that a physical limit just bounded by the speed of light and the age of the universe? Like, so theoretically, yeah. outside yeah. of waiting, there's no way. That's right. So we, we can, and, and I should say, we're not waiting until next semester. <laughs> <laughs> so it is a question of waiting. Hopefully, there'll be something around the wait for it. But we're talking, you know, comparable to the current age of the universe. We're talking about, you know, tens of billions of years or more, likely. It's a, it, the scales we might estimate to find these things. So it's waiting for a pretty long time. But in principle, you're right. We are waiting for our own present horizon to grow. It should keep growing as the universe gets bigger. More and more you know, signals from that, uh, should come into our horizon over time. But for those kinds of cosmic scales, it takes a while. Yeah, relating omega to the shape and flatness of the universe. So what is the it's one, but it's larger than one. So could we equate it to the a slowing expansion that eventually increases and approaches one, but never gets there, but slightly increases for for an infinite amount of foreseeable time? It's a good question. So um, the short answer is um, inflation should drive the universe to, to arbitrarily close to one, exponentially close to one at very early times, and then it really should start to gently flow away from one from that usual big bang argument. Um, why it should flow towards um, slightly uh, more closed and open, that, uh, uh, I, by the way, you look, look, I, should, I should first call, call, caution and say, look at the error bars are large in the signal. This really is what we say consistent with one of the high accuracy. Uh, so we, it's not that we found definite evidence for a deviation from here. One could imagine a deviation because it could have gotten arbitrarily close to one at early times and then been flown away. Now, for that to be at all observable today, at least in the usual scenarios that we've thought about, you have to kind of tune inflation to last just long enough and no longer. Right? You'll get closer and closer to one the longer inflation goes on. So the earlier and the earlier universe will be arbitrarily close to one if inflation lasts a very long time. If inflation lasts just long enough to be consistent with the observation and then just happens to stop, has minimal but sufficient inflation, then you could just imagine barely seeing it make a flow just enough away from one today over the next 14 billion years. But that requires a different set of, set of constraints on the early universe that don't seem very, uh, there's no reason to think that would have happened. So I, I think my, my personal take on this is more to say this is an extremely difficult measure. It's amazing the error bars are as uh, tight as they are, and this really is consistent with one to any, any kind of clear measurement, uh, rather than saying we found some, some clear hint of the deviation. There's another question. Yeah. yeah just a small question. So uh, just the beginning. The light stretching yes. in the universe, and so I guess there's like an energy loss of that photon. Mm -hmm. Where does this energy go? It's a great question. Yes, it is really a uh, redshift. The average energy per photon really is is uh, is falling over time. It's losing energy. You, <clears throat> it's very hard to talk about total energies in the context of general relativity. Uh, and so um, we all know there's a conservation, a strict conservation of energy in some Newtonian mechanics and even special relativity and so on. Accounting for the, where the energy loss goes uh, in, in an expanding universe is, is a bit trickier. And I'm wondering, I'm going to turn to Alan. How, how would you account for, for the energy <laughs> actually loss of the photon as the universe stretches? Uh, well, first of all, maybe you're right that uh, talking about total energy in general relativity is a very tricky thing. It's controversial, actually. People look at it in different ways. Mm -hmm. uh, but the way I look at it, it is considered in a fairly simple way. Uh, and the energy loss of the photons, I think, can be viewed as the same energy loss that we see if a photon travels from the floor to the ceiling. That just loses gravitational potential energy. As the universe gets larger, everything's getting further away from everything else. Uh, that increases the gravitational potential energy. And I think it can be viewed as something which is genuinely an energy conserving process. Thanks. That's why I invited, I invited along for reasons. <laughs> <laughs> Any other questions? I'm, I'm curious. Yeah. Uh, was the multiverse concept ex in existence before Sagan died? Oh, 
Yes, in various forms. In fact, a colleague of mine, I mean, really a long time before Carl Sagan. Carl Sagan died in 1996. There are plausible versions of multiverse scenarios going back to ancient Greece. So really, really before Carl Sagan. Right, probably right, not the right, guy right. you know. I'm saying uh, some, more, the, more modern, the more modern ones. Yeah. That's right. right. Um, it would, the, the, the ideas could, I bet we could document the ideas. The enthusiasm, how many people were paying attention to those ideas, that's a different measure. And I think um, certainly, by, well, again, Alan could answer uh, probably uh, more accurately than me off the top of my head. But the interest in something like what's called eternal inflation goes back quite a, quite a ways into probably the late 80s and early 90s, so before Sagan cast away. That's the idea that the average rate at which space is, uh, the volume of space is growing during inflation, the, the, that average rate for, for stretching of space during inflation in many models is greater than the average likelihood for a given region of space to stop inflating. So inflation ends, so, you can think of it sort of like a radioactive decay. There's a kind of half-life, an expected time during which you expect that point in space right there to stop inflating. You can think of it that kind of way. And the average time scale for a region of space to stop inflating in many models, that likelihood, that, that time scale uh, is longer than the time scale for the surrounding space to keep inflating. So inflation will definitely stop there, has some likelihood to stop there, but it could keep inflating in other places. And so there was that that could lead to one version of a kind of, uh, of multiverse, or at least of internal inflation. So it, the space, some space could be stretching forever into the future. That could lead to an enormous volume of space far, far, far beyond what's being sampled by, for example, the CMB. Those ideas, I think Andre had a Scientific American article on that in 1994, which means the work was done in 1992 and three years ago. So those kinds of models were certainly being talked about by the late 80s, early 90s. I think yeah, actually, early 80s. Even that early. Uh, okay. Yeah, Lincoln had a paper in 83, and uh, yeah. Linda had papers, I think, in uh, Linda is 83, Lincoln 83. Yeah. That was first published in 86. There you go. Yeah, thank you. Okay. Yeah, so we're going to have to end it there. Yeah, please. Um, I have a memory that several years ago, I think one of the um, measurement teams down in Antarctica, I think it was the Bicep 2 uh, measurements, they yes. had had this big announcement that they had had they uh, strong confirmation inflation, they had to backtrack on it. What's the status on that? Uh, could you give a little bit of background? Because my memory is way too big. Yeah, um, not like I thought, I actually have some slides. I'm so glad you asked. Uh, yeah, so that was it was um, terribly exciting and terribly confusing for a while, and now I think we have a clear indication of what happened. So you're quite right; your, your re recollections are quite clear. I'm just going to forward to to them. A few more. <clears throat> yeah. So one I, I mentioned briefly one of the predictions from another prediction from inflation is that there should be these gravitational waves roiling through space. Those should also, in principle. Uh, be measurable in something like the cosmic microwave background. It should give rise to a different kind of signal. And I think about it, if I go back, if we go back to that um, sort of dance party analogy, gravitational waves are a different kind of stretching uh, and squeezing of space. And so you can see an illustration here. Now, I, I, these are not in the same frequency range as the gravitational waves that were quite successfully measured by the LIGO team, again, with huge MIT participation. These mean a different range of frequency, but the idea is pretty similar. So the idea is that gravity waves from inflation should be um, squeezing and stretching space-time, uh, traveling outward. So that by the time those hydrogen atoms first begin to form in that sort of dance party, it's like the auditorium in which the dancers are dancing would be alternately squeezed and stretched. And that would lead to a kind of corkscrew pattern in the photons we find in CMB. This is from the original bicep paper. You should see a particular kind of, literally kind of corkscrew, a kind of curl-like pattern, which really comes from this particular pattern of stretching and squeezing, which we characteristic of gravitational waves, distinct from the, from the other kind of waves that really we do measure quite, uh, quite directly in CMB. Here's a picture of the BICEP satellite at the South Pole. Uh, we have a big celebration here at MIT. Here's Andre Linde flexing his BICEP. That's, there we go. Uh, we were having uh, a non-alcoholic apple cider toast. It wasn't really champagne. Uh, and then uh, within a few months, other independent teams began to reanalyze. And the, the short version of what seems to have gone wrong is that the BICEP team was using um, a, a, an overly optimistic model for what we call the foregrounds. What else could have led to that kind of corkscrew shape in the, in the CMB? They were estimating a much lower amplitude of any late universe corkscrew contributions. Uh, 
Uh, and that seemed to have been overly optimistic. There's even more of a backstory to that, but the short answer is they were mismeasuring the kind of foregrounds that would also yield that similar kind of pattern in the sky. And so the uh, upshot of these sorts of analyses uh, is that the signal that they, they definitely measured that B mode, that corkscrew-like pattern. It's not that they weren't measuring the actual pattern, they were attributing too much of it, maybe far too much of it, to a genuinely primordial source. That you should expect that amount of corkscrew pattern that they successfully measured would be fully consistent with other known physics of quite mundane late universe sorts. Um, certain kinds of um, sort of intergalactic dust can actually lead to that kind of pattern. Uh, and so they were, they were subtracting away too little of the foregrounds and attributing too much of the signal they measured to a primordial source. Uh, and that was exciting and terribly disappointing and every emotion in between the roller coaster for about 18 months there. But even the BICEP team itself came along and published their own reanalysis with other collaborations saying this is consistent with late universe dust, basically. The signal we measure is consistent with non-primordial origin. Now the search continues. Uh, the BICEP group and others are building newer arrays of telescopes, uh, many of them uh, back at the South Pole and some in other locations on Earth. Uh, trying very hard to remeasure that with a better handle on foregrounds with measuring in multiple frequency bins. Part of the problem was it, it, was, a, uh, it was hard to, to subtract away the foreground because it has a very particular uh, signal with frequency. But if you only measure basically one color, you don't know if, if, how that line is trending. If you measure the same signal in multiple colors, multiple frequencies, then you should be, have a much better handle on what's foreground, what's primordial. So, th so the, the, the quest is ongoing. Uh, but the short answer is, as of now, there's been no definite detection of primordial gravitational waves from inflation. I, I do, I, I get a, a little concerned, a little upset by that characterization. You're quite right to have repeated it. But it came out a lot of the time that this was sort of like the smoking gun of inflation. That's one prediction among several. That one is, in some sense, most model dependent for the height of those gravitational waves one might expect from any given model of inflation. And inflation, to my mind, has passed beautifully, impeccably, several other tests uh, with, with the measures we actually do have in hand, like the other patterns in the CMB. So to have talked about the smoking gun of inflation, I thought was an overstatement at the early times, and that came back to haunt people at the, at the end, when it turned out early announcement had been quite premature. So I think there are many kind of compelling sources of empirical evidence in favor of these descriptions, these models. That last one is most dependent on the particularities of a given model of inflation. And so, yes, I think it should be out there. I don't have any, I don't have the same confidence to be at that same particular height of those waves. So not seeing it is perfectly consistent with many, many, many models of inflation. So, so uh, the waves could really be there, but it would be of too small a height for these kinds of methods to detect them. That's what I'm yeah, but, that's, but you're right, it was, it, was a, it was a heck of a roller coaster. Any other questions? Um, I think outside we have apple pie and um, candy and stuff. Great. So. Thank you. Well, thanks so much. Thank you very much.